Okay, welcome to our item Shabbat Parashat class. Bismillah Tabah Parashat Bereshit. The unsung hero of Parashat Bereshit. Who is that and why? Parashat Bereshit, of course, presents to us creation, the dominion, the power of HaKadosh Baruch Hu over this world, is creating the world, yesh me'ayin, from enough matter from, from the absence of matter and the incredible depth and mysteries behind the creation of the universe. But besides that, this parasha also presents, presents to us the essence of man and the saga of man, not just in the generations covered by this parasha, but the saga of man for all times. This parasha introduces us to the idea that man is innately flawed, that man imbued with free choice has the ability to choose good and evil, and that man uh, has the tendency often to choose the wrong, make the wrong choices, to falter, um, and to, to pay the, the, the consequences of his mistakes, that man um, indeed does determine his fate. And we see throughout the parasha Bereshit that there are consequences, reward and punishment for man's decisions, that man um, does merit the intervention of God in his life, and that man always has the ability to be resilient, and to turn it around, to bounce back up, to change his faith, to change his ways, and certainly to beckon the assistance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in that process, in the drama of his life. All that is introduced to us in Sefer Bereshit through the stories that we know, through the stories of Adam and Hava, their expectations, their mistakes, um, and you can say their perseverance through their life, of course, the famous Cain and Hevel story and saga and, and the faults of Cain, the lessons of God to him and the way he seems to be resilient afterwards throughout his life and, and, and possibly turn the corner. Uh, we see the, the general downfall of man and at the end of the parasha, the hope of man simply because of the righteousness of a single individual, namely Noah and a, a few of his forefathers perhaps had guided him in the right way. So throughout all these stories, um, we are introduced to the saga of the story of mankind in Parashat Bereshit, uh, through 10 generations worth of existence. At the end of the, towards the end of the parasha, when there is a, a listing of the, the lineage of man and the descendants, starting from Adam's son, Sheth, and going through Noah, which are a total of 10 generations and a total of uh, almost 2,000 years from Adam Adishon, we get to the seventh generation. And the seventh generation, we are introduced to someone called Hanoch. His father was Yered. His father lived 962 years as did most of those generations live over 900 years. And Hanoch um, has a total of five, uh, four Pesukim dedicated to his life, a short paragraph, as do most of these other generations. And yet Hanoch is concealed from us in absolute mystery, is an enigmatic character and description by the Torah. What do I mean? Let's point out by going through the Pesu King. It says in Pedic Head chapter 5, Pesuk Kaf Ale, verse 21, in Bereshi. It says that Hanoch was 65 years old and he had a child in the Pesuk Kaf Bed. This is the first time, um, and this is prior to Noah, that there's a description of man by his character, by his lifestyle, the first description of man in the Torah, a very positive one at that. 
אחרי הולידות מתו שבע, שלוש מאות שנה. And Hanoch went with God, for lack of a better term. But of course, we're familiar with that terminology um, from Noah, right? It's Ha'elohim hit'alech Noah. And from Abraham, where Hashem told Abraham, hit'alech lefanai v'hi'etamim. But the first character, the first person who merited this description in all of the history of mankind is Hanoch. Hanoch went with Ha'elohim, God, 300 years, had children, and then Pasuk Kav Gimel says his life spanned a total of 365 years. That's it. Really, you know, a third or 35 to 40% of the average lifespan. That was it. Hanoch, a life cut very short. And it ends by telling us in Pasuk Kav Dalet, Bait Halech Hanoch et Ha'elohim, seems completely repetitive. It once again says that he went with God. And doesn't actually explicitly say that he died. It says, And he's not. He's not here anymore because God took him. A very unusual way to say that he died. So um, we're not sure what exactly was the, um, the essence of Hanoch and the righteousness in his life that God complimented him in such a way, not once, but twice, why it repeated the exact same description by Halech, he went with God. Uh, incidentally, it didn't use Yudke Vavke Amonai as the parasha had already get, gotten used to doing, rather high of him only. And we certainly don't know why that this unfortunate uh, person seemingly lived only 365 years which is such a small percentage in comparison to the rest of the generations. <coughs> and why the Torah says that instead of just describing his death as by Yamot, that he died, that he's now no longer here because God took him. If you look at some of the sources in the Midrash, you will find some um, very, again, mysterious and fascinating Midrashim speaking about, speaking about Hanoch. Most of them, I would say, is positive, but again, uh, very uh, enigmatic and difficult to understand. He was named as one of the nine people that we know, including some goyim that went straight to Gan Eden. After this olam, whatever that means, went straight to Gan Eden. Okay. Um, we're told that he was born circumcised, whatever that means. Another Midrash speaks about the fact that um, he seemed to be righteous, but wasn't so righteous. He also became wicked. He also became evil. And at a certain point, and Rashi picks up on this, Hashem said, you know what? Let's just take him away while he's still righteous. Sounds a little familiar from the Ben Soledo More, right? Another Midrash speaks about the fact that he, Hanoch, went up to heaven and he was named by God as the Matatron, the great Sofer, the great scribe. Um, and we are told as well that Hanoch walked with angels for 300 years, dwelled amongst the angels for 300 years. He interacted with them. He learned from them. He uh, was able to amass an incredible amount of knowledge in the sciences and other realms of the universe up there with the angels adds up to uh, a, a very um, mysterious formula of his life. And there is a, a famous Sefer, uh, not so famous actually, Sefer Haikalot, that has this long description in the history of, of this man's life and speaks about the fact that um, he reached incredibly high levels, spoke to angels, um, and at one point in time, God said, you know what, go back down and up with the angels and share your, share your wealth of knowledge and your heights and spirituality with mankind. And he did so and gathered people and, he, and they anointed him king for 200 years. And then they called him again and they summoned him to heaven. They made him a scribe. He was interacting with the angels. Um, and at a certain uh, point, 
He went back down to mankind again. Uh, just um, absolutely fascinating in one hand and mysterious on the other. What's going on with this man's life? Now, you certainly have to acknowledge that there is a tremendous amount of positivity being conveyed to us through these sources. I'll just add on a little bit in terms of the Peshat analysis. Uh, Rabbeinu Bachia picks up on the obvious fact that he lived 365 years, which is, of course, the days of the Earth's revolution around the sun, the solar year, 365. He said that's not a coincidence. That is, now, of course, a person dies when he dies, but God has control over that. And here there's a message from Torah that he very much related to the sun in that he took notice of God's universe and part of what brought him closer to God and elevated him to these higher levels of understanding, of knowledge, of interaction in perhaps spiritual realms was the fact that he learned and understood God through God's universe, through that Shemesh starting point, through the, the massive sphere of the sun relating to planet Earth. He also picks up on the fact that all of the rest of the generations when speaking about their days, by Yihiyu, it says, and their the days were in plural. Only by Hanoch does it say, singular, by he, Kol Yemeh Hanoch. Alluding to, says that Ben the charge, God's first command in creating the world, when he says, Yehi Or, and hinting to this Or Elyon, this uh, heavenly light, meaning this metaphysical spiritual realm that Hanok was able to enter. And this, uh, you can say, uh, intellectual uh, search of his that ended in such a uh, incredible mass of knowledge and insight and understanding of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The uh, Abarbanel picks up as well in the 365, echoes what Abin Abahiyah says, and says also perhaps that is symbolizes and indicates that he was sort of like the celestial beings and the sun and the spheres in his obedience to God, in the way he subjected himself to God. Of course, the laws of nature never change. And you can say that you know the planets, the stars, the sun, etc., subject themselves, are subservient to but who so too was he. And also does Abad Benel pick up on the fact what I mentioned is that here only. Um, Hanok is only uh, spoken about vis-a-vis -vis Hashem with the name of Ha Elohim, right? Twice, right? Halek Hanok and Ha Elohim in Pasuka Bet and Kav Dalut, perhaps indicating in the beginning of Parashat Bereshit in the Torah, Hashem was only called Elohim. Throughout creation, he's only called Elohim, and perhaps indicating that it's that was the life of Hanok, that he recognized Elohim, the Creator and worshiped him his entire life. And so you have, even within the Peshat, you have these fascinating midrashim and all this literature with, um, with the, the type of curious stories and, and uh, you know, events of his life that are being conveyed to us. And then you have the Peshat of the Torah and the wording and the nuances within the terminology indicating also greatness to us. So certainly there was greatness. On the other hand, you have you know, partly the Midrashic literature indicates some negativity in his life. And I think if you just try to put that all together and synthesize the Midrashim, the Midrashim, the actual shot of the Pesukim, you really come up with the storyline, the life of Hanukkah. And thereby, with that storyline, come up with perhaps in the saga of, 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 of mankind, the greatest lesson that we can come up with. And perhaps that's why I said what I said in the opening of this class about Hanukkah. So let's try to get into it right now and go back and put this together and come up. Let's piece the pieces and connect the dots and come up with a presentation of Hanukkah's life. <clears throat> so here it is, Hanukkah. He's born like everyone else's, but he chooses through his free choice, chooses not only to do good, but chooses to recognize God and by the way, Abraham Avinu was given the credit as the person that rediscovered God, so to speak, but then spread the knowledge of God throughout the world. There are others, and the Rambam mentions this 
in his introduction to Halakhut Abu Dazara, who talked about the history of Abu Dazara, the history of mankind, that there were certain people that I call them closet believers. Hanoch, Metushelah, and then Noah, where they were righteous and had an incredible, reached great heights and they had a great relationship with God, and yet they didn't successfully spread that word. That's why Abraham, I Abinu, mean, of course, was chosen. Um, but in any case, it seems that Hanoch reached incredible intellectual heights. So much so that this world, and by the way, at this point, the seventh generation, we know that star worship, Abu Dhat Kochavim, was rampant already. And that the, the concept of God, once you got into the third generation, the Rabbah explains this to us, started to dissipate and be forgotten, really. By seventh generation, you know, Hanoch, it, it was living possibly in a very ungodly world, in a very, in a world that stooped to, to the depths of a depraved type of lifestyle. And this man extracted himself from this lifestyle and instead did quite the opposite. He found God. He dwelled with the angels, the upper realms, so to speak. He reached spiritual heights. And in terms of his understanding of the existence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that man almost never reaches, besides the heroes of our Torah. And he spent, you can say, the bulk of his life uh, with that type of advancement in intellectual knowledge and spirituality. And at a certain point in time, Hanoch, you can say, maybe gave it a shot. And he was, as the Midrash was alluding to, trying to spread the word, trying to publicize. And uh, that became a very difficult venture because he came back again into a depraved society. He came back into a world where their morals and values were so lowly. He was so alone and isolated that he couldn't really bear the influences. And relative to them, he was weak. And he started to show the flaws of man. And you can say that this giant started to fall and be drawn into this immoral, depraved society. And was not strong enough to sustain that great level that he was uh, experiencing for most of his life and perhaps came crashing down. And that perhaps is not only what the Midrashim are alluding to, but when the in the Pesukim, um, the, the original description of he went with God, which is referring to most of his life, there was some type of stoppage there, told us of the 300 years he lived after he had his first child, and then repeated again by because there was some type of gap there where Hanoch was having a very difficult time. And perhaps the great Hanoch, the man of God, the holy Hanoch who walked with the angels, who drew so near to the understanding and existence, the essence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, could not bear the surrounding environment and was drawn in and crashed down. Perhaps almost be one of them and at some point in time, remembered who he was. And he clawed his way back to the top. And he tried with all his might. And he called out to God to help him retrieve his original status. And as he got there and drew closer and started to become once again who he once was and returned to his original self and heights and accomplishments, the Torah once again repeats and says, Hanoch et And at that point in time, as the Midrash was alluding to, and as Rashid describes based on the Midrash, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, in his great love and compassion and mercy for Hanoch, he's not going to make it. There's no way he can hold on in this type of world and society to his greatness and his righteousness. And I'm not going to allow him to come crashing down again. And therefore, the Torah says, not a natural death at all, far from it. The enemy. And he was no longer. Which means prematurely, God made a decision, but very mercifully, mercifully, mercifully. 
did God take him from this world as a favor to Hanukkah? So that he leaves this world at his height, at his best, right? Retire at the peak of his career and not allow him once again to descend into the lowliness of his surroundings. And therefore, Hanukkah stands for us as a model, not of perfection, because man is flawed, as a model of the heights that man could potentially reach, and yet still with all uh, the flaws and potential mistakes that man can make, even the greatest of men, a better and a higher and a more powerful lesson. And that is that man can be resilient, he can persevere, he can make a comeback, he can, he can erase his flaws, you know, this is Teshubah, and he can actually make up for his wrongdoings and retrieve himself to the way he used to, could have, and should, and know he can be. And that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is part of that process, and he recognizes that process, and is our greatest cheerleader, and roots us on. And when he sees the effort, and when he sees the perseverance, and the clawing and dragging ourselves back into what we want to be, Hashem looks down and says, that's the guy I know. Not the flawed individual, who is experiencing the natural tendencies of man, but the individual who expressing a self-determination is becoming and coming back to being what he really can be with all the strength. Hashem recognizes him as that. That's the real person. That is the real Hanukkah. That's the Hanukkah that I embrace. That's the Hanukkah that I want to remember, so to speak. And that's the Hanukkah that I'm going to do the favor with in a very exceptional example, but who knows how many times God has done this to man throughout history, by preserving his greatness in an unusual fashion by removing his life from this world. And thus the Midrashim and the Pshat and the Midrash and the commentators all come together to present to us this dramatic life of Hanukkah. It's a thing that motion pictures are made out of, the life of Hanukkah. And the Torah went out of its way, of course, again, in a very um, brief, succinct, and enigmatic way, but went out of its way to give us the hintings of this man's life, who really wanted us to pick up, exceptional, it's the only time it's done here in Bedish, to pick up on the nuances of this man's life and be inspired by it, and make this the greatest lesson that Parashat Bereshit has to offer us in the great saga, in the existence of mankind, the life of the great Hanukkah. Amen, amen, Shabbat Shalom.